There, we will continue on in Titus. And continuing on in chapter 1, picking up at verse 5, and we'll go to the end of the chapter. Um, and this is really a interesting study on church leadership and requirements and and these things that you might say that the Bible very clearly lays out how the structure is to be done and who and what the qualifications are um, right on down the line. It very clearly lays things out, but there is a certain amount of overlap between some of the different offices in the church and we will see that there is all these different offices and I'm talking about the church in, lar in large and then we'll also talk about the local congregation but these offices overlap but that makes perfect sense because they all have the same purpose every office in the church has the same purpose and that's for the building up of the body of Christ so there's going to be a huge amount of overlap but there's also going to be specific responsibilities that are stronger towards this office than that office and we're going to look at a lot of these different things so we're going to start off with in Ephesians we're actually going to go through um, three passages before we actually get into Titus but just to kind of lay a little bit of a foundation so in Ephesians 4 11 to 13 and this is what Christ gave to the church what he was let's say to to establish it and he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all obtain that unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the measure and stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ Here's, again, laying out the purpose, the purpose of all these different offices. And then also the one that it doesn't mention in here, and we're really not going to delve into, is the office of deacon. But I'm just going to read this one little passage that talks about it. Deacons, likewise, must be men of dignity, not double-tongued, nor addicted to much wine or fond of sordid gain, but holding to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. These men must also be tested. When then let them serve as deacons if they are abound, beyond reproach. Women must likewise be dignified, not malicious gossips, not temperate, faithful in all things. Deacons must be husbands of only one wife and good managers of their children and their own households. We're going to see that same qualification when we come to some of the other offices, but that's, this is just more foundational background things. And then in First Timothy, the elders who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. So it's kind of also kind of what the office of the elder is as far as preaching and teaching. And it's just, these are just foundational things that help us as we actually delve into Titus. So starting off in verses 5 and 6 of chapter 1 of Titus, for this reason, okay, Paul is telling Titus that he left him behind and there was a particular reason why he left him there. See, Titus was an evangelist. Paul was an apostle. Okay? Now, an evangelist is one that travels from place to place spreading the word of the gospel of Jesus Christ. No, John, John the Baptist was a prophet. Okay? Um, Billy Graham, Billy Graham is an evangelist, okay? And like I said, the offices overlap each other considerably because, like I said, we're, they're all teaching and instructing toward the same end, the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So this is why Paul left Titus there in Crete. Now, Crete is also interesting from the standpoint of the fact that they, it's an island off the coast of Italy. And, but if you go back to Acts 2, at the time of Pentecost, you will find the story in there about how the apostles are teaching after they be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
and all the people in around there are hearing it in their own tongue, in their own language. Listed in that list are Cretans. So we can pretty well assume that at the time of Pentecost, there were those that went back home to Crete with the gospel. Paul later on comes there and, of course, provides more instruction, more building up, more establishing. So now the churches are becoming established there, but they still need more instruction, more teaching. So he leaves Titus there in order to establish the church and the order in which the church is supposed to operate. And he sets this in order and to appoint elders. Okay, and that's the first time that I say it jumps into the word, to the office of elder. And of course, and now we're going to look at what are the qualifications of an elder and what are the responsibilities of an elder. Next part is says, namely, and now he lists out the different things. If any man is above reproach, has one wife, believing kids, eh, well, what has that got to do with having one wife and believing kids? Right, and, and this is really important because it ha the person needs to be established as one who has actually a track record proving their abilities in order to rule in a godly manner. Now, does that mean that a person cannot be an elder if one of their children leaves the faith? No, it doesn't. It really doesn't because we can only do the things that are within our control. There are things sometimes in life that are outside of our control and we can't do anything about these things and those we just leave to God. But if the... Right. And it's more a, case of, more a case of younger children and if you can't rule your younger children well, now when you get to adult children, I think that's a whole different territory. But I think it also points towards where you faithful, and you can see it in generation to generation. Okay, and this is the best because you're, if you're following God's pattern in a family, it's generational. It's not just this one set. There is so much truth, and until you become a grandparent, you don't realize how much true it is. But you, when you're raising your children, you are raising your grandchildren because the influence you have on your children will carry over to the next generation. Now, if you're raising your children with the total neglect of the things of God, your grandchildren will have less. And it's always going to diminish. And that's, the, that's just a reality in our human nature. The commitment will diminish. Now, thankfully, in our family, we can literally go back to the 1200s and there was a constant, consistent faith throughout the generations. You can be the first of the generation. Right. Somebody's going to stop it, or somebody can start it. No, really. That, that's, that, that's the point here. It is so important okay, I did not have this background then, but I can be the one that establishes this. And this will carry on through my children and through my grandchildren. Now, we can be those that, you might say, also neglect this history. And say, well, you know, my family has always, and we're going to look into that a little bit more as we get a little further down. But my family always has been, so I automatically am. That's a danger. But here again, getting back to as I directed you, um, and not accused of debauchery or rebellion. Okay, not accused of having a wild lifestyle, basically. Now, that doesn't mean anything about being falsely accused, that means being justly accused. The lifestyle of this person must be demonstrated in his everyday life. It must be demonstrated in the manner in which he lives, not just in church, but in the world day to day. and must be seen that way. 
the world has to be able to see that this person is different, is not the same. And then verses 7 and 8, an overseer. Now we got an all of a sudden a new term, but the overseer is actually the elder yet. The elder. Okay, it's still, but it also a pastor is an overseer, but also is an evangelist an overseer. So it's actually covering all of these at the same time. And like I said, they overlap each other so much. An overseer must be above reproach as God's stewards because the person in leadership in the church can do so much damage to the word of God and to the message of the gospel by what they do and how they live. And this is why this above reproach. Now here, I, as I'm going through this, and I'm studying this, and I'm putting this all together, as your elder, believe me, there's times when I look at this and say, do I measure up? And I say, not totally, no, I don't. Um, I'm not perfect, and that's the part that makes me understand the fact that with all of us, we have that. But these are things that to be strived towards. And there needs to be actually a history of these things being proven to be true to a large extent. Not perfection, because perfection is not obtainable in this life. Not self-willed, not quick-tempered. Here is one of the dangers I ran into years ago as an elder in our former church in Michigan. Okay? Uh, the church was, I say a larger church, not a huge church, but um, I think it was 120, 130 families. So, you know, I say a decent sized church. And um, the board of elders, um, I believe there was 12 of us. Now, the danger I found myself in was because I can make a good argument, I could pretty much direct the direction the church went. I could sit in that meeting because most people won't say anything. And I don't have that issue. I will speak up. And it dawned on me, even though I might say, I wanted to do what was right, I wanted to do what was godly, but I realized the fact that I actually could direct decisions simply by arguing with somebody, debating with somebody, and bring them around to seeing it my way. Now that's a dangerous place to be in because what happens then is now Christ isn't the head of the church. I'm trying to put myself as the head of the church. And I learned that I was doing this from my dad because when he was growing up in his home church, the Nyhoffs had such a large percentage of the male population in the church that they decided who the elders and deacons were going to be. Because they would sit down and they would talk about it and they would decide, well, this person is, a, I say, a good one. No, this one, we really don't want that one. And whatever they decided at home is what happened. And he later on talked about that. We didn't even realize what we were doing. But we were actually deciding how to run the church. Now, I come here and I say, now there's the same danger. Okay, this is a small congregation. I don't have other elders to argue with or to debate with. So what if, yeah, there are a few of you that would be more than happy to have that debate, okay? And I, to be honest with you, I really appreciate it. But in order to actually hold myself more accountable, I have a friend of mine, and actually there's two of them now, that watches these videos. And people that I know that are godly men, well versed in scripture, with their responsibility and the promise they made to me is they would watch those videos and let me know if I'm wandering from the truth. They are holding me accountable. I need that. I know I need that because of the fact I am human and I am sinful. So now I just brought on another one, a former pastor, to do the same thing. He's a retired pastor, um, 
very interesting character. We can go into that something else. But he, I want people that actually hold me accountable. Because like I said, the danger comes in is when we think, I am in charge. I know better than you all do. And so I'm going to tell you what's right and I'm going to tell you what's wrong and you're going to listen. No, that's not the way it works in the body of Christ. We are a unit. We are a unity. The word of God is correct. Christ is the head of the church. That may never be forgotten. Not greedy, not addicted to wine or violent, greedy for gain. Not doing this because of the big paycheck that I collect. Okay. But hospitable, a lover of goodness. And hospitality is actually probably one of my weakest points. I'm. Yeah, uh -huh. that's about it, really. Uh, I scare people. Um, it's just not one of my strong suits, okay? Yeah, after a while, after it kind of after it wear on you a little bit, okay? I understand that. Uh, prudent and upright, devout and self controlled, okay? Devout, that. Yeah, I, I take it very seriously. Self-controlled, I wish I was more self-controlled. Okay, so. You must have a firm grasp on the word in verse 9. Okay, that I do. I, I have a pretty good understanding of the word of God. I, I know that, but that's a gift that God has given me. Um, and and I am, there's times when I'm extremely grateful for it, and sometimes when I don't really want to right now. Uh, but and then I get this guilt because I'm not fulfilling what God has called me to do using the gifts he's given me. So he'll straighten me out. Trustworthy in accordance with teaching, and that really falls back into that same category of what I preach, what I teach, must be trustworthy. It must be true. And this is where it goes back again to this accountability factor. And this is why, because I don't trust myself, I have others that hold me accountable to make sure that I am teaching the truth, that I'm not wandering from it. So is able to both preach with sound doctrine, and doctrine, that word doctrine literally means teaching, and refute those who contradict it. Now, there again, that falls into the category that sometimes scares me, but also helps. Those that argue a different perspective, uh, argue something that is taking a stance that is not true, that is not right. Generally, I will catch these things pretty quick. Um, and I, I don't really totally understand it other than the fact that God has gifted me. I can listen to somebody preach and teach on something and they'll say there, there were 25 men that went and did this thing. And I know that it was only 20. And I will catch that. I don't know why, but I will. But at the same time, it's not me. It is the Spirit of God working through me. But at the same time, I have to recognize the fact that I can't depend upon myself. So in verse 10 and 12, For there are empty, empty talkers and deceivers, and especially those of the circumcision. Now that's an interesting little line, because those of the circumcision. And this is going to kind of get into where the dangers lie. Now, the members of the circumcision were the Jews that had said they became Christians, but you still had to obey all of the Old Testament law of Moses, so you still had to be circumcised. This was a requirement to be part of the body of Christ. And Paul is saying, no, this, this is a dangerous and this is deceiving. And the reason why, and we're going to get into here in just a minute, because it upsets whole families, it causes conflict because you're actually because you're teaching a lie. And whenever you teach a lie, it creates problems, it creates a conflict. Yep. Um, and there's a whole group of other ones. But who must be silenced. These people cannot be standing up on the pulpit and be teaching these things, or in a classroom, teaching these things. That cannot be permitted. The church may not allow that sort of teaching to come in. It is, so that was never true. 
the old that was never true. The circumcision requiring of circumcision in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, yes, it was, because it was pointing towards the blood sacrifice of Christ. Once the blood sacrifice had taken place, there was no more sacrifice to be done and they'll be pointing to blood. And this is why circumcision ended at that point. Now, did it mean you can't get circumcised? No. But it's not as a ritual to become part of the family of God. Because they're teaching things they should not. And then we get a little bit more into explaining why. And I don't know if any of you are familiar with the five solas. Solas. The five solas. And this is why the teaching, when you take Christ plus, it's actually Latin. It's Latin. So you weren't terrible far off. There, there are some acquaintances between the two. Sola scriptura. Scripture alone is where the truth lies. All teaching must come from Scripture, period. Okay? Sola fide, by faith alone. We are saved by grace through faith alone. Sola grata, by grace alone. What does a sola mean? Only this. Yeah, there's a few different... Right. Right. And then sola... Christos, Christ alone. We're saved by Christ alone. There is nothing else. And this is, this is probably one of the big ones. And this is why the circumcision concept is so bad. Because you're saying that the sacrifice of Christ is not good enough. Yeah, it requires something else. So any teaching that comes into the church that says it's Christ plus must be rejected. Because it's not Christ plus, it's Christ alone. And then the reason behind all of this, sola de gloria, glory to God alone. Everything that is done is done for the glory of God. It's not for the glory of me. It's not the glory for self. It's for God's glory. Any teaching that wavers from these five has to be rejected. Now, there are more truths, but these are such foundational truths, known as the five solos. These have been around a long, long time. And, but they're, again, not taught anymore. It's just kind of one of those things, like so many, that are forgotten about. Because otherwise, you run into this kind of rules. Rules, you must do this, you must not do that. And that where our faith is built upon the concept of it's Christ plus these things I need to do. That's like a great question I got this morning about tithing. And we take that and we apply it from a concept of a rule that I have to give 10%. So I sit down and I get my calculator out and um, I figure up exactly what I do because if I don't give 10%, God is going to be unhappy with me and he's not going to bless me. So it's a rule. And when we focus on things from that perspective, we're missing the truth. It's not a rule, it's a guide. Yes, and the 10% is a guide. And it's a wonderful guide. It actually demonstrates God's great love towards us. He didn't say 90%. He said 10%. A small portion I want you to set aside and I want you to get into this habit of doing this because you want to. Not because you have to. It's not, again, a rule. It is a guide. Because then James has this great line that talks about this. But someone will say, you have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without the works, and I will show you my faith by my works. I love that passage, because it so clearly states that truth. 
It doesn't make works bad. No, works are good. The reason behind them is what matters. Because I will demonstrate to you that I have faith in Almighty God by the way that I live and the way that I act. I don't live and act in a way so that I have God. No, because I have God, I do this. So easy to switch that around. And this comes back to the responsibilities, again, of leadership in the church, of making sure that these things are understood. And not allowing teaching to come in that contradicts that, that goes against that. Because it says, like I said, it's taking Christ plus. There can never be Christ plus. In verse 12, now Paul is talking about, it, it says, one a prophet of their own. Okay, and he was talking about probably one of the poets who were known as prophets of, of the Cretans, um, who was, they had a fair number of fairly famous poets. Um, being, Cretans were Greeks, just so you kind of put that all together. And uh, yeah, they're, 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 they were, you might say, more for that concept of philosophy and life, except for Cretans were known for being pretty wild. Okay, that had, they had that, uh, yeah, okay, and so, and the, one of their own prophets or poets said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. Okay, now we can make statements similar to this and say it about Americans. Okay, and because the, the next line says, this is true. We can say that about Americans and say, yes, this is true. There is a truth, even though the words are coming from a heathen mouth, there still is truth in it. So just because the evil mouth spoke it, doesn't make it untrue. Because the truth is still the truth, regardless of who spoke it. And it talks about Jewish myths. And there were lots and lots of myths that the Jews have and still have today. Um, one of the more famous ones was that prior to creation of Adam and Eve in this world, that there was, the earth existed, and this is where the angels lived until the angels fell and then God kicked him out and then created man. There is absolutely no scriptural proof or any other thing for it. It was just one of the myths. And, and there's a bunch of these. And, but then we also have myths in the church today. We have things that people will bring up that there is absolutely no scriptural support for, but they're implying things that cannot be supported. And they become myths. And people start adjusting their lives in order to fit these myths. And one of the greatest myths is, if I'm a good person, God will love me. And if I'm a bad person, God will hate me. It's not true. It's because of the fact that God's love is not conditional. So it's going contrary to the clear teaching of Scripture when people bring these myths in. Now the world has all kinds of myths of what Christians are. Well, that's not our concern. Our concern is what is taught in this church. Because it's the commandments of men, not the commandments of God, that are being followed. This is like the Pharisees were known for having all of these rules and regulations that you had to abide by. But they were commandments of men. They were not commandments of God. In verse 15, to the pure all things are pure. In other words, those that are of the family of God and genuine children of God, our sins have been paid for. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. This is a hard thing even for me to grasp. It, it really is. The fact that God the Father sees me as he sees the Son. That all of my sin, past, present, 
future have been wiped out. They no longer count for anything. That is a hard thing to grasp because now the things, that I've been purified. I've been washed in the blood. So there is nothing that can stain that because that can't be taken away. Because God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. It's so clear. We come a child of God. We stay a child of God. Now, he might give us some training. He might give us some hard times in order to bring us around, to help us. But it's all for our benefit. It's all for our understanding of knowing who he is and being able to serve him better. Because it's for his glory alone. We're back to that same soul. But those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing. In other words, a person who is unbelieving, both their mind and their consciences are defiled. Because we wonder sometimes, how can a person do such a thing? You know, doesn't their conscience bother them? No, their consciences are corrupted. And their person can get to the point to where they have no conscience anymore at all. That's spoken of in Romans 1, where the consciences are seared. There is a conscience that is a gift from God that every person has to start with, but it can be seared, and it can be dulled to the point to where it doesn't seem to affect. And people do things because there's nothing guiding them. In the last verse, 16, they profess to know God, and these are the people who roll around and say, yes, I am a believer. But by their deeds, detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. The people that go around and claim to be a Christian, but their lives so clearly demonstrate that they come, they do their duty by coming to church on Sunday every so often. And then, but their lives during the week have absolutely no bearing on it whatsoever. They're worthless. We see them as opportunities. God knows their hearts. God calls them worthless. But he calls us to reach out to them. We are to reach out to the worthless. Why? Because before I became a child of God, I also was worthless. Please stand and sing. He knows my name. One of the lines in that song just really spoke to my heart. It says, he knows my name, and he speaks it to the Father. And I thought, wow, he knows my name, and he speaks it to the Almighty God. And to me, that just was... It was one of those aha moments that you have. And then uh, I thought of this song, um, He Knows My Name, so if you'll play the track, Dion. I think we've sang this before.
want to know that you know our name and you bring it up before the Father. And the Father hears us. When we come before you, you hear us because you love us. Lord, as we go from this place this morning, may we share that love. But also, Lord, we pray for your blessing on the remainder time this morning that we spend together. That we will learn more from you. That we will listen. We will hear. You teach us, Lord. Teach us your truth. So that we go equipped to live for you, to serve you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.